The Block Talk podcast started because of my passion for the property management industry. I wanted to start a conversation and add some value within the industry with a diverse range of people and professionals who can add something extra. As we start out, my aim is that the podcast offers some useful insight into a variety of views, opinions, thoughts, and foresights from our guests who include business leaders and industry experts. If you enjoy the podcast and want to find out any other information, head on over to brianwelsh.co.uk. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Block Talk podcast. A bit different this week. Today we're speaking to Andy Bright, Action for Pulmonary Fibrosis Corporate Partnerships Coordinator. AFP is our charity of the year and Andy has personal experience of life as a PF patient. Having developed pulmonary fibrosis in his 40s and following a 10-year journey, eventually receiving a life-saving double lung transplant in 2018. Great to have you on, Andy. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Thank you for for having me here today. Brilliant. I'm loving the T-shirt. Yes, it's my my uniform. I I worked for insurance, in insurance for 25 years, and my uniform used to be a suit, collar and tie. These days, it's an action for pulmonary fibrosis T-shirt. Brilliant, brilliant. I I think the suit has has, um, gone by the wayside, to be fair. I don't remember the last... In fact, I don't think I own a suit that now fits me, to be honest. No, I I remember I I moved to a a broker's and and I banned ties. This was in the the noughties and it was was fiasco. (laughs) It's like, we can't do that. So times have changed. No, they have most definitely. They have the best. Okay, so um, you're our charity of the year at CPL. Can you tell us a bit about the charity? In fact, I'll tell you what, before that, tell me what is pulmonary fibrosis? Explain it to me. Uh, Yeah, sure. Um, Pulmonary fibrosis is uh, also called lung scarring. Uh, Right. It describes a a group of interstitial lung diseases uh, where the oxygen, uh, the lungs become progressively smaller and stiffer, um, and that eventually leads to uh, low oxygen levels in the blood. Um, and that means that obviously the oxygen can't get through into the muscles, which means they're tired, people are fatiguing. Um, when I got to end stage in 2018, my uh, gas flow, which is how much oxygen gets through, was 21% what it should have been. Um, oh, wow. Pulmonary fibrosis affects around 70,000 people in the UK. Uh, there is currently no cure. Um, the average life expectancy is three to five years. Um, oh, wow. However, there's a lot of research going on, which is leading to improvements in treatment and care. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a tough disease. It's a tough disease. Yeah, it sounds it. It sounds it. So tell me about the charity and how and why it started. <clears throat> um. Action for pulmonary fibrosis was formed in 2013 um, by a a small and ambitious group of patients and carers. Uh, Two uh, leading institutional lung disease doctors, one of which treated me, and I I attribute the work that he did with me as as saving my life, and and a registered nurse. That's all it was at the time. Um, The result is a charity that puts patients first, we're patient-led, and and also their families, because it's, as I mentioned earlier, is everybody who's living with the disease. That would be the patient, uh, loved one, uh, care, uh, partners, loved ones, children, grandchildren, everybody's touched by the disease. Um, so that's at the heart of everything we do. Um, this unique uh, connection, uh, drives everything that we we we've achieved already, and what we hope to achieve in the future. Um, obviously, ten years ago, we talk about times changing. Uh, knowledge of the disease uh, amongst health healthcare professionals uh, it was quite patchy. My GP put it down to what I ate in the early days. Um, Is that right? Good yeah, yeah. I, I I made the mistake of telling that I like the odd curry and a pint. 
And he said, well, <laughs> who does it, right? That's the, that's the that's why you're coughing all the time. Um, there, there were very few specialist doctors or nurses are then, um, and patients only had limited access to to pulmonary rehab, which obviously utilizes the the oxygen that they they have in their body more efficiently. Um, and there was very little research going on into causes or treatments. Um, again, when when I was involved. Uh, I say 2008 or thereabouts, there were no effective drug therapies uh, and only a handful of specialist hospitals. Um, there were also very little support groups either online or around the country. Um, couldn't find any printed material or or anything online for families that was useful. Um, people, you know, were... I mean, I did. Is when you when you get the the uh, the information from the doctors, you go on to Doctor Google, and again, yeah. as I said earlier on, the first thing that jumps up is you've got three to five years to live, and that's terrifying. Yeah, yeah. So we touched a wee bit on your story, and I've got some questions I want to ask. But what? what so so you went to the doctor. They said it was because of curry and beer. Um, and then, and then, kind of, what what happened after that? T- tell us a bit about the well, story. Was, um, I used to describe it. I was misdiagnosed, but having worked for the charity now um, for two years, I've learnt that I was I was diagnosed with the information that they had at the time. Um, so, yes, my my doctor said stop eating what you're eating, um, but I went for a. a uh, chest x-ray and it came back and uh, the, the, the GP said there's there's something on the image that we're a bit concerned about um, so I went to the hospital and they told me it wasn't cancer which of course was was good news then but um, you learn after a while that um, you know the, the disease I had uh, kills more people than leukemia so a year um, so yeah, so then he started a long journey of these diagnoses. Um, I was sent for a, a what's called a VATS biopsy, which is a video assisted thoracoscopic surgery, and basically they put a camera in through the side and a couple of other implements, and they take a piece of the lung and analyze it, and uh, that led to two different diagnoses over the la- over the following couple of years. Um, eventually I got to 2012, rather, 2012, and the consultants of the hospital said, you, you know, your, your lung disease, your, your, your lung functions are, are, are declining, um, but there's not much more we can do. We'll see you in 12 months' time. Well, I have a, I have a, a motto that I've had for, for many years, which is never give up. That's because I used mm-hmm. to play sports, a lot of sports. And I would never give up. And I adopted that in my my personal life. So as I mentioned earlier on, I went to see this doctor, Gisley Jenkins, in in Nottingham. And uh, he carried out further tests and uh, came up with a definitive diagnosis. Um, And that was pulmonary fibrosis. Um, And that was when in 2013, we knew that within three to five years, I, I would need a, a lung transplant if I was I was going to survive. Okay. Okay. What happened after that then? Well, it got it, it got progressively worse, um, which was which was inevitable. We tried uh, several things to try and slow down the progression. Um, at the time, there were there were two drugs that were available, but because I didn't have the right sort of pulmonary fibrosis. I wasn't. I wasn't eligible for the the drugs. Um, you had to have a specific type of pulmonary fibrosis, um, which was a bit tough, really, because I, I, there was drug. There were drugs on the market that were available that could potentially slow down the progression of my disease, d- disease and uh, extend my life, and I didn't qualify, and that's that's tough. So. Um, Gisley said, because of the, the way that my my d- disease presented, is that there was anecdotal evidence that um, 
chemotherapy could slow down the progression of the disease. And I says, well, let's do that. Never give up. Let's, let's try that then. And again, because it was, uh, quite controversial and nothing had been proven, um, we had problems explaining that to the people who were going to carry out the chemotherapy. So that took another 18 months to get sorted. And, uh, it was to and fro in between Nottingham and Birmingham. Eventually, I had the chemotherapy in, in 2014. And we believe to that day that that extended my life for a couple of years, which got me to the, the transplant. But after that, 2015, I'd go back and and, the, and, and every time I did the lung function tests, um, it was going down. And that's pretty much what every person who has pulmonary fibrosis is facing. You go back, you're happy if the lung function tests haven't haven't dropped dramatically. Um but the that they're inevitably they're going downwards. Um so in my case we kept on top of things. Um I did the pulmonary rehab. Um I tried to stay as fit as I could. I'd go to the gym and walk a couple of miles. I'd be on the treadmill uh, and I'd have my oxygen cylinder on the side of the on the side of the machine, again, you get some funny looks, um, but you know you have to accept that's what it is. I, I used to, I and I still do say that it was a, a a badge of pride. If anybody asked me what it was all about, I'd tell them. Um, it, it, the, the conversation usually went like, um, "Why are you on oxygen? Um, do you have asthma?" And uh, I'd say no, and they say. Do you, do you have COPD? And I say, no. And they say, Did, do, you, do you have lung cancer? And I say, no. And I say, I've got pulmonary fibrosis. And 99 times out of 100, it would, they would say, what's that? Yeah. And, yeah. and that's tough. So yeah. that was 2015. I was on the, uh, I was on the, the radar of the, the lung transplant team at uh, Queen Elizabeth in Birmingham. But he, uh, it was it was like everybody patient with pulmonary fibrosis. It was how quickly quickly would I need the transplant, or how quickly will I die? That's the sad reality of it. Um, mine got worse, and as uh, 2018, um, I got to what say end stage really. Um, I'm I'm always been quite a, uh, a practical person, and uh, I started researching my own death, um, planning my own funeral. Um, I have I have this idea of, of, of when I've been buried or cremated that uh, I'll have a Wild West coffin. So uh, nice. I, got, I contacted, a, contacted a local carpenter and we were designing my own, my own Wild West coffin, uh, talking to my best mate about, he, you know, would he walk my daughter down the aisle when I was gone? Because she was... She was getting engaged and I wouldn't be here to walk her down the aisle. Um, I took my wife out for a, a wedding anniversary meal in September of 2018 and said this will be our last one. So those, those are the kind of conversations that people with pulmonary fibrosis need to have. Sadly, some people don't feel they can have them. And that's where the charity comes in is because it gives them information either as a parent or as a carer or as a, a family member gives them information as you know what what can be expected um but also what can be done i mean there are there is hope on the horizon which is uh what we're all about really amazing story amazing story so so small charity um, what challenges do you guys have to overcome being a small charity in the in the country? Yeah, uh, well, um, obviously, we're on the back foot from the very beginning uh, compared to all the the well known charities um, because not a lot of people have heard of pulmonary fibrosis. I mean, I always use as an example of my own family. Um, my mother had breast cancer twice and died of heart failure. Um, my father had to have bypass surgery in his 50s, and he died of cancer. Um, my sister-in-law 
unfortunately she she lived with multiple sclerosis for many years so all these charities all, all these people all these diseases have big charities that are well known my father-in-law had parkinson's disease um so what we've got is we haven't got the kind of funding that the british heart foundation have cancer research have macmillan's have to to have these big um these big advertising campaigns so whatever fundraising that we get we have to make sure that it's 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 spent in the in the, the most efficient way we can really um so we do things like uh, approach the bbc we had a, a lifeline appeal which went out just before the world the last world cup which was great it was a eight nine minute piece that was on the bbc um we had we raised quite a bit of money from it but it was also about raising awareness um letting people know that that disease is out there and uh what we're doing to to uh, one to support the people that are living with the disease um and also what we're doing to to help fund research to stop the progression of the disease ultimately stop the disease and and cure it really so we, we don't yeah. have the kind of fund finances that everybody else has but we do use it most efficiently that's good. That's good news. So you are our charity of the year. Um, and how we decide that is we um, we ask our team uh, within the CPL to give us uh, suggestions. And then we pick kind of top three, four, and then we go out to social media and ask people to kind of vote. Um, and you guys won hands down this year. So there's a fair amount of... Um, there's a fair amount of uh, fundraising going on. We're doing the three peaks later in the year, but I'm not. Two of the guys are. <laughs> uh, we're doing office to office walking, which um, there's a number of the guys already started. But Excellent. I did some. I, I I joined it a couple of days ago. I did some this morning as well. Um, so can we talk about? I guess that your your uh, your role as corporate partnerships coordinator has something to do with kind of getting companies to um, provide to the charity. How does that work? Well, obviously, we've got lots of people, usually because they have a lived experience of the disease, who uh, who do different things, as you say, like the, the, three, the three peaks. And, I mean, even before the charity, uh, before I started working for the charity, I was doing fundraising myself. So it was like yeah. we'd, have, we'd have parties and, uh, any money raised from that would be donated. Uh, since my transplant, I've actually abseiled down the whole end at Villa Park to raise money for it. And uh, myself and my colleagues have um, we did the Zip World in North Wales last year, which is oh, okay. the is the longest in Europe, which is just under a mile long and goes up to a hundred miles an hour. So that's what people can do that on, on an individual basis. Obviously. That raises a fantastic amount of money. But um, what we're looking to do with the corporate partnerships is is find people such as yourselves who are, who are prepared to put it out to their staff and become part of our family. Um, because I always call my, 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 my pulmonary fibrosis family and my transplant family, uh, and you're now part of that, um, because it's, it's so tough. It was, I mean, I was touched when, when I learned that it was, it was one of your, your, your colleagues who'd who'd lost a loved one to it. And as you know, having been through it, I can totally understand where they were. So we were over the moon um, when we got it and, and the charity are really excited. Um, my role is to go out and find as many as I can. Um, yeah. Companies that have um, have an association with us. I mean, we like to term it as a, like a positive association. So you get something out of it. And we get something out of it. We get, you know, the opportunity to support people, fund research, um, campaign, and, and educate. I mean, I referred earlier on to the uh, my GP, and that GP isn't standalone. That's a lot of GPs. So yeah. working with, with with corporate partners like this, one, we, 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 we raise important money. Um, but it gave, gives us a, a, a wider voice as well. So I, I, you and I understand 
do uh, software for estate agents. Yeah, property managers, block managers, yeah. Yeah, that kind of thing. So hopefully that will will spread out then to to those companies as well. So they become aware. And uh, it's important from our point of view is that we raise awareness to the level of like cancer and the level of heart disease uh, as quickly and as, as positively as we can. Good, good. So all that, all that um, kind of um, fundraising, and you touched on this slightly, but I just want to ask you a bit more about it. Um, so what, what resources do you have for people living um, with PF and also supporting them and their families? Um, well, um, it, it's grown dramatically um, over the last few years. I mean, when I first was diagnosed, we didn't, I, I didn't get any support from anywhere. There was no support groups. There was no printed literature. Um, there was nothing. Uh, so I, I had to rely on, on Dr. Google. But APF, as I say, over the years, they've progressed. They've added more services to what we can do to support them. Um, for the last two years, I've been a regional support coordinator for, for APF. And that's that's uh, helping the uh, 70, well, we have over 70 now, uh, support groups around the UK. So they're support groups run by either uh, patients, carers, or healthcare professionals, and they meet on a, a regular basis um, where patients and families members can go to, and uh, they share their hopes, their fears, and their aspirations, and they learn more about the disease. So that's the support groups. Uh, directly, we've got a support line that uh, is manned at the moment. It's it's Monday to Friday, nine till five, but hopefully in, in, in more time, we can extend that. And that's where people have maybe looked at our website, um, found some information, but they, they want more clarification. They can phone the support line and uh, speak to somebody there or, or point them in the right direction. Again, with the, the money that people like yourselves will be raising, we're intending to employ a, a registered ILD nurse, so someone who has specialist knowledge in the area uh, and will be able to give more pointed advice. Uh, we've also got um, a monthly online carers group because the carers' needs uh, are different to the patients. They yeah. have questions that you know they may not want to ask their loved one uh, or they can't ask their loved one because they don't feel it's right. So we have a monthly online uh, carers group there that's run by one of our peop- one of our members of staff who's had lived experience of it. She lost a mother to it, bless her. Um, we also have our pulmonary fibrosis transplant support group. So a transplant is, 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 is quite daunting operation. Um, mine lasted nine and a half hours. Um, I was in a coma for eight days because of complications with the, the heart and the kidneys. Um, yeah. So those kind of things have to be considered as a pulmonary fibrosis patient to whether if you luckily enough to be considered for it, what questions do you need to ask? So we have a, a this support group, which is made up of uh, pulmonary fibrosis patients and post-transplant patients. Yeah. So we can, share, yeah. we can share ideas and they can ask questions. Um, we work closely with with healthcare professionals because obviously they're at the sharp end of it. Um, we launched an initiative called the One Voice ILD, um, which is uh, involving uh, respiratory specialists from all around the UK, getting them together and and discussing uh, um, different things. I mean, our priorities at the moment are obviously to raise awareness, um, but we've been working with trying to raise awareness with parliamentarians i know they've got a lot on the plate at the moment but we need to raise that with them to to support on our mission um the one voice ald will gather data and build an accurate picture of around the country so we know what people living with pulmonary fibrosis are going through and what the impact on their life is because that's sometimes not considered you know that somebody's got a disease but you don't realize what's going on in the background in their life. I mean, my, I lost my career in insurance because of it. You know, I, yeah. I, I, I sold for a living and for three years I couldn't speak. Um, yeah. 
And, and, and obviously what we want to do is develop a gold standard for clinicians around the country so it doesn't become a postcode lottery as, as yeah. the agenda yeah. is at the moment. Yeah, okay. That, that's been hugely interesting, Andy. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I never, I hadn't come across it until the, it became our charity of the year. So that's really interesting. Thank you very much for all that information. Is there anything one? So hopefully, I mean, you know, we get a lot of um, people listening from the property management industry, and you know, and and, and, and lots of companies have, um, you know, charities of the year and things they do for charity. If you could just kind of say one other thing to the listeners, what would it be? Uh, support to our cause uh, and support you in your endeavours. Um, it's it's a little known disease, and we want it to become a big known disease, so that when uh, people go to their GP uh, and they, they listen to the lungs, that the GP says, this could be pulmonary fibrosis. And immediately then they go on to the healthcare professionals and they follow yeah. the national care path that that uh, the One Voice ALD has, 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 has paved the way for. Excellent. Thanks very much for coming on. Thank you. My absolute pleasure. Good luck with everything. Thank you.